The basic tenet of Christianity is... Whoa, 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 whoa. This is coach's timeout. Don't you dare tell me about the love and the compassion of your so-called God. Because if he felt like sacrificing his only begotten son, well, that's his business. But he should have bloody well kept his hands off of mine! What do you think it does to the boys to take the death of their brother and use it as part of your carnival act? Pays the bills. Hello and welcome to the Holy Scriptures and you. We bring the scriptures down to our level so that we can understand as the early apostles understood, eyewitnesses to the passion, death and resurrection of Christ and his entire life of teaching. They are invaluable not only in the Gospels and Epistles but also as St. Paul said passing down whatever I gave you of oral or written tradition or words. So we use all of these. The Holy Spirit is faithful, believe me, and the gates of Hades have not prevailed against his church. It is hidden like a treasure in the field. Uh, it has been overcome by a lot of the propaganda from the Western church the uh, Frankish church, the warrior church that took over in, tenth, in the 10th century has pretty much uh, done through advertising and propaganda and rewrites of history a cover-up of the real church as it flourished until uh, it was invaded by the Crusaders in 1204 and then being weakened but still uh, operating as uh, Constantinople, the new Rome, we uh, were finally defeated by the Turks who made it through the walls and uh, the great walls of Constantinople were cloven and uh, the Turks came in and besieged the city and killed the emperor and everyone else who was fighting for the Lord. Uh, of course, it is still under the control of uh, Turkey, which is now Istanbul. But we are allowed, uh, insofar as is possible under the Muslims, we are allowed to preach and teach in the area that is just strictly around the headquarters of the Patriarch, <clears throat> excuse me, of Constantinople. Now, all that to say, these traditions have been carefully handed down. They're under martyrdom, they're washed with the blood of the saints, with the blood of Christ himself as it continues in the lives of the martyrs. What we have to say is so unique because, again, there's been a reteaching, a false teaching that originated in the 1100s as the Frankish church took over the uh, Roman bishops they moved from being Orthodox Christian into being a Frankish appointees of the Emperor in the West. What they based their teaching on was Augustine as you know if you've been following us 
not Augustine of Canterbury. There was a lovely uh, Augustine in the English, in the British Isles, uh, the uh, head bishop of Canterbury. This is Augustine of Hippo in North Africa, who was a Platonic philosopher. Now because of philosophy taking over virtually in the West a thousand years ago and then reviving during the 1700s, we're going to give you a little clip of Father Dr. Ozkul as he talks about philosophy and how it's a mind game. It has nothing to do with the revelation of faith in Jesus Christ as we see in the Gospels and the Epistles of our wonderful church and Christian faith. We first learn, we draw from the early apostles, especially Irenaeus of Lyon, the hero martyr as we call him, uh, and many other of the fathers, uh, those who were taught by St. John the Apostle. Mm. As we know, Adam fell in the garden. He disobeyed God. The second Adam was prepared to come even then. In Genesis 3, we got the promise that a man would crush the head of Satan. So we have the second Adam preparing to come. Now, no one in the prophets, maybe Isaiah a little bit, were prepared to say it was God coming in the flesh. The name Emmanuel first started appearing. God is with us. And then slowly, Christ came, the preparation was set, and he was born in Bethlehem, as was prophesied in the prophet Micah, one of the smaller books of prophecies. The second Adam came to restore us from what was stolen by the enemy, by Satan. That was our life with Christ, with God, in paradise. That is restored by the second Adam, and also the mortality that is passed down from Adam even to us as small children, as babes. As soon as we're born, we are conscious of the mortality that is in our members because we even get sick as little ones. This belies the whole idea that we are born sinners I've heard people look at these darling innocent babes and say, oh, what a sinner. What kind of nonsense? They're not believing their own eyes and the witness of their hearts. We have complete innocence in these babes. And we see it as soon as they're baptized, especially as infants. This longing to be good and to receive the Lord in the Eucharist. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The second Adam, Lord Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, died and rose again. He died in the flesh. He died in the flesh, went into Hades, and by his divine nature there, still wedded to the human nature, he routed Satan and death. And that is where Adam was found by the second Adam. He is raised up and joined with the other Old Testament saints and Christ as he takes them up into paradise and restores them. This is what we do not hear in the West. Let me give you a little history of my own journey here and how I discovered this. While in seminary, my chosen thesis topic was what happened from the cross to Christ's resurrection. And the reason for that is the Pentecostals had horribly subverted the entire teaching 
to say that Christ had had to suffer under Satan in hell. This, of course, meant that he gave up his divine nature and suffered as a man because they had valued soul more than the body. It did not matter that he was on the cross. The teaching of the Pentecostals, in which Jesus had to suffer as a man being tortured by Satan, was popularized by a person, E.W. Kenyon, an early radio preacher in Los Angeles. But because of this quandary, the fact that there was nothing available in Protestant theology or in Roman Catholic teaching that would answer what happened after Christ's death and entombment in the body. Thus, searching for answers, I visited an Orthodox church hearing that they had a beautiful teaching on Christ's triumphant harrowing of Hades, as it was called, in the uh, United Kingdom, the, the Oxford University writings and uh, theses done by scholars and by uh, Orthodox Christian bishops. Because of this, I went to a Holy Friday service and wept through the whole thing as Christ was described as breaking down the gates of Hades, defeating death and defeating Satan. There was my answer from the early church, the earliest scripture. All of that was put together and given me as an answer. The very God who created the world entered it and dwelt among men in order to reclaim what had been lost to the devil through the fall of the first Adam. Our freedom and the blow of death, of course, is what became of our first parents. At one time, all things were subject to Adam. Now they will be subject to Christ, the second Adam. He came into the world to transform creation into a new Eden and restore the state of things to us before the fall, as if man had not fallen. That leaves intact our freedom still to choose God each day of our lives and so become virtuous and be able to have crowns in heaven as well as a place in his presence. St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 47 that Adam, the first man, was made a living soul. The first is of earth, earthy, but the second man, the last Adam, is heavenly. Jesus, therefore, is the new king of creation, even as Adam had once possessed dominion. Of course, this is in his human nature that is utterly uh, joined with the divine nature as the word of God. But as the second Adam, he needed as a man to defeat Satan, since a man, Adam, and of course Eve, his partner, had fallen to the wiles of Satan and fallen for his deceit. The second Adam, writes St. Irenaeus, established himself as head of all things, visible and invisible, and subjects them to believers who are united in his church, which will become the universe in the age to come. The end for which creation has been ordained by God has already begun in the church. It began with the incarnation, the pure Adam, the long line of human beings who furnished us with his salvation so that what we had lost in Adam would be reconciled to us in Christ.
The new atheists criticize Christianity according to assumptions that are native to the Western understanding of religion. These assumptions, theological, ecclesiological, and even anthropological and cosmological, originate in the Occidental Middle Ages. The new atheists, and all atheists, are unwilling to confess that their worldview is indebted to Western Christian thought. Moreover, the new atheists are ignorant of what we call Eastern Christianity. If they knew that truth was not the product of reason, they would have encountered God, the one true God, not the abstract deity of Western thought. Unfortunately, the argument of theists delineated in public debates only strengthens the position of the new atheists. In himself, God is unknown and unknowable. And, but it, just, it, it starts in the Middle Ages with uh, faith should become rational. Fide es quid, intellectus. You, they wanted to prove what they believed to become, they wanted it to become rational. And that has always been the ideal in the West. Make whatever is, is a matter of faith provable, dem demonstrable. And, te and Tennyson says you can't do it. We've tried, we tried it. We started with Descartes, we started with the uh, 16th, 17th century, then the 19th century, the curse of all centuries, thanks to Marx and Hegel and Freud and all those people. So I wanted to show that there must be an alternative to this. Life isn't worth living. Look what's happening now. St. Cyril of Jerusalem said that with the end of the Roman Empire, the world would be cast into anarchy, anarchy and apostasy. And with the death of blessed Tsar Nicholas and his family, that's what's happened to the world. Look at it now. Well, first of all, uh, you have to be open to it, you have to be receptive to it. And uh, you, uh, you can't come to God. Of course, God revealed himself in nature, but of course, if you're not looking in, in nature for anything. But uh, Christopher Hitchin revealed the main, one of the main sources for... Uh, for atheism. I think it's, uh, it's funny. He said, there are only two things in life that interest me. The one is debating, and the other is fornicating. And now, that's what he believed life was all about. Well, the fathers teach that there's no access to God without holiness, without morality. One has to seek the good, seek the... God will come to you if you, uh, if, you, if you look for him. The problem is in the West it, is they trust too much in reason. And therefore, God must be something rational, an object of rationality. And, and, and that's only possible if God is being. The Holy Fathers teach he is beyond being, he is ipurusius, beyond understanding. And, uh, but there's no way to reach God unless you want him, unless you seek him. Mean, he'll probably seek you anyway, but uh, you know, if you're not going to uh, look for him, he's not coming to you. Well, there's, there's uh, the four famous, they call them the four horsemen. And uh, Christopher Hitt Hitchens, Daryl, uh, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris. Anthony Flew, that's, he's the father of them all, until he died in what was it, a couple of five or six years ago. He told them, he told these fellows, your trouble is 
the reason you're not going to convince many people is because you haven't, you haven't solved the epistemological problem. Epistemology is a theory of knowledge. You had to prove, well, for example, there's a philosopher, English philosopher, who said, supposing I have a, 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 a billiard table, and I have a man, same height, it's, it's the same man who uses the same implements, and he's trying to put the, the ball, the ball into the pocket. Now, he does that, standing in the same place, same angle, same ball, same everything, and, and uh, he shoots the ball, and it goes in the pocket a thousand times. You can't prove that it's going to, on the 100, 1001, it's going to go in there. You can't prove it, because you can't show it. The response came from Immanuel Kant, who said, it, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about proving it uh, empirically. You know, it's, it's up in your mind. Everything's in your mind. Everything. It all goes back to the Middle Ages, back to Thomas Aquinas and uh, Duns Scotus and all those people. They all wanted to, they wanted to pr prove, they wanted to prove by reason what was not attainable by faith. They had a challenge from Spain, from the Muslims. They, had, they produced many important, important thinkers and so on. And it was a challenge. So here comes Thomas Aquinas and says, ah, but we can show you, we can show you by reason what we believe is true. And so uh, uh, from then on you have what they call scholasticism, which means uh, philosophers were from the schools, scholastics. Uh, but uh, uh, he, there are people who challenged him. Uh, but the source of your faith is, is something spiritual. It's in the heart, the karadiyya. Spirit, pneuma, and things like that. That's the basis of Christianity. But you can have, you can have, for example, you could uh, see a beautiful scene or something. Isn't that beautiful? And you say, well, there's a God, see that the beauty shows it. Okay, fine. Then empiricism has helped you. It's just giving you beauty. But it's, it's not the source of your faith. Your faith comes from within. The main difference between new atheists and, and the old atheists, 19th century paleo-atheists, is that the new atheists have written books, many books, and they wanted to sell it to everybody. They want everybody to read it. They think everybody should be an atheist. The old atheists, if they converted anybody, it was somebody in their classes, because they, uh, they uh, taught philosophy and so on. They say, God is this, God is that. But, uh, they didn't care, because they don't have TV and radio either, but they didn't care if you were an atheist or not. I, I suppose they'd like you to, have, to be one, but they didn't care really. Uh, they, they thought they were in possession of, of the divine truth. And uh, uh, whatever disciples they could make, that was fine. But uh, no, these, these people are, the new atheists are eager. They want you to believe what they teach. This is not uh, just, uh, it's, it's not like somebody going over to China and studying, but, Buddhism, you know, that's, that's you, you know, I can do that, it's fine. No, they would, if they were Buddhists, they want everybody to be Buddhist. We give you now the record of the life of the martyr, Father Daniel Sersayev. He was a missionary in the heart of Moscow, Russia, ministering and converting many Muslims and others who were of the Eastern religions into the holy faith with his excellent teachings and classes that he held in the church. Here is a little insight into his life and his death, and of course his glorification now at the right side of our Lord Jesus Christ. Который абсолютно осуществился как христианин, и в нем без препятствий действует Святой Дух, способный исцелять, способный свидетельствовать, способный воскрешать все, что было обещано апостолам. Отец Даниил участвовал в различного рода дискуссиях, диспутах. В меру своих сил и талантов он отстаивал Божью правду. 
Ну, наверное, самое сильное слово, которое он произнес, это то слово, свидетелями которого мы все являемся. Если человека убивают за Божью правду, то это значит, что правда сия разит людей, ее неприемлющих. Это значит, что она обладает огромной силой. И каждая новая кровь, проливаемая за Христа, сеяла обильно семена веры и собиралась жатва. Знаем, что и этот подвиг жизни и смерти – Отца Даниила есть большое, великое семя, которое, будучи посеяно плодоносную почву, принесет свой плод. Для всех нас, кто посвятил себя служению Господу, предстояние всему гробу должно побудить глубоким размышлением о смысле и характере проповеди в современном мире о важности служить делу Божьему так, чтобы каждое наше слово достигало ума и сердца слушающих, чтобы не впустую, не в духовной праздности и лени проходили дни нашей земной жизни. Верим, что Господь примет душу раба своего в небесные свои обители.